Welcome. I'm super happy to host this webinar. Uh, my name is Yulia Hulkova. I work at NIMSI Insights. NIMSI is a research and consultancy company from the US. Uh, the headquarters is in Seattle. If you are like not aware of what we do, well, our research and consultancy is um, mostly uh, aiming to study um, and also help develop the industry of translation and localization. Of course, the vital part of this uh, industry and activities there is the language technology. And one of the major sectors there in the language technology overall is the translation management systems market, uh, or TMS for short. That is why we are welcoming you today to discuss exactly this part of the pie, <laughs> slice of the pie, I should say, the TMS market. And we have amazing panelists here who do exactly this. They develop such kind of uh, technology. And also, of course, we have a wonderful moderator, Ishvan Lengid, who is my colleague at NIMSI, but also wears another hat at his company, Be Lazy, uh, which is very, um, experience in terms of integrating things and also integrating TMS with other technologies. So with that, my super short introduction is over. I'm passing the mic to Istvan and uh, uh, letting him run this show. Uh, so again, thanks everyone for joining. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you for organizing this webinar together with Nika. And uh, welcome everybody. And thanks for, for joining tonight or this morning, depends on where you are. Uh, I think we've got a very interesting uh, panel here. And just before we, before I give the floor to the participants in the panel, I would just like to give you a little bit of a background on myself here, more than my company. Uh, so I have worked, like, I don't know, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, my background is with a translation management system. I have uh, been one of the founders of uh, MemoQ. Uh, I left the company in 2016, so I'm not with them anymore. And uh, after that, I used to work at LSP, at, at an LSP in Spain. And I also uh, joined NIMSI more than a year ago. And at NIMSI, my job is mostly technology. So I'm a technology consultant. I am working almost exclusively with enterprise customers who are interested in deploying technologies. And one of the things that's very interesting is that um, last year I was in four bigger projects. And out of the four bigger projects, we did not recommend the same TMS to two customers. And I think that this is uh, the spirit in which I believe we should, we should uh, run this panel today. To find an uh, to understand like what are the needs of the different customer types and and how the different companies are trying to cater for those needs because there is no one size fits all solution there is no best TMS I got that in the in the Excel file and one of my big learnings over the last couple of years was that every TMS is carving the niche and as we move with the technology. Uh, if you start to use a technology, even your mindset is changing. You are kind of uh, getting acquainted with certain concepts and you are applying those concepts. So you are getting deeper and deeper. And this is a risk for the users. I mean, if you look at, for example, the world server users uh, that have been uh, using that system for, for 10, 20 years without one thing or without being able to change or without being able to justify the change, but it's also a risk uh, for the developers of translation technology, that they get uh, quite comfortable with their user base and do not attract others. And in this panel, we've got uh, three very interesting uh, panelists. And uh, the surprising thing is that it was also the first time with us, like with me, I only also met them for the first time on Monday. We have never spoken before, even though I've definitely been involved with a Memsource and Smartkit as well. Uh, and uh, TranslateWise is so new that they just changed the name. So before, instead of going into further ado at this, at this moment, I would like to ask 
my panelists to introduce themselves. And ladies first, so let's go with Sam. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, and greetings from Estonia. Of course, ladies go first. Um, and perhaps just um, to mention that um, I'm not a professional in translation, either localization industry, uh, maybe the only one in, in this webinar today, but I'm extremely enthusiastic about multilingual communication and efficiency in translation management. I'm the co-founder of uh, TranslateWise, and um, at my previous jobs, I found that localization and translation management is extremely hard. Uh, and for most of the companies um, in the beginning of the expansion, it's simply not affordable. Uh, so our solution um, simplifies and, and gives a new definition to translation management. Uh, it's more focused on the small and medium-sized companies we are combining the translation technologies, collaboration and cloud storage. So our mantra is simplicity. And in terms of uh, workflow, you can, you can think of uh, more of crowding or localized, but it's in a more simplified form designed for marketing and communication purposes uh, to translate and manage uh, styled long form text. And um, I, I think that's enough for the introduction. I'll pass over. Excellent. Thank you very much. Igor. Uh, hi, my name is Igor, and uh, I'm joining this panel today from sunny California. Uh, I am a senior product manager at SmartCat, an all-in-one localization platform that basically is a hub for freelancers, uh, language providers, and, and customers. Um, allowing you to localize uh, any um, like technical or marketing or support content with ease. Uh, before joining SmartCat uh, half of the year ago, I was a head of localization at Evernote, so I know uh, how end customers work with localization and what they need and how to uh, set up processes uh, in, a, in a scalable way. And this is exactly what I'm doing here at, uh, at SmartCat. Uh, making uh, sure that the platform is suitable for automation. Thank you, Martin. Yes, hi, my name is Martin and I'm the Chief Product Officer at Memsource uh, based in the Czech Republic. So I'm joining from a snowy uh, Czech Republic. And, uh, you know, I've been product manager for about last maybe 15 years and the last five years out of that, I kind of ooched in into translation management but I've been an engineer always, uh, so I don't have any linguistics background or anything like that. Um, so, and then the last two years with Memsource, so. Mm -hmm. As far as I understand, Martin, you were also, you were also working with a company uh, earlier that was managing translations and you were helping with the uh, processes there. Uh, yes, correct. I was part of the IT specifically working for marketing and I had, uh, I was in charge of a lot of uh, deployments of systems like content management systems and digital asset management system. Uh, and one of the, one of the assigns, assign, assignments that I got at that time was uh, deployment of translation management system, which I have to admit, I thought it was going to be very boring, but then, but then I, I was wrong, right? I know I just insulted 85 people on the phone, but I was I was very wrong. Actually, I sort of fell in love with that. It was it's very interesting. There's a lot of opportunities for improvements and for innovation, and then I just didn't know that. So I got into the TMS uh, market, and then Memsource was one of the was the system that we actually uh, deployed at that time. So I was really glad that there was an opening for product manager about two years ago, and then I jumped on that. That's very interesting. I mean, one thing that, that probably um, a lot of the attendees will notice is that nobody here is a founder, So, every, except Sandra, sorry, but nobody here has been in the company for more than two years. Uh, so nobody has a long history uh, either in the industry. I mean, Igor does have a long history in the industry, but, uh, but doesn't have a long history with the, with the company you are working with. And because of this, I would like to understand a bit, like working for your company in the last two years, working for the provider of, of technology that you are working for today. Uh, what were the most important learnings? What were the most important findings in your personal experience? 
Well, I, I remember I remember sitting at the interview uh, for the job interview with with David Chania, who's our CEO and then our CTO, and then it was also another product manager. And I, I really like MemSource. I still do. Uh, and I was talking about it that I feel like the product is really complete and it does everything that anyone can you know needs, and then there's nothing really missing. And I, I remember like you know David looking at the uh, Dali board the CTO and it's like. Like he's got no ideas. Like there's so much missing. There's so much you know that we still need to do, and that was exactly that. So that was the biggest kind of a learning that you know as a as a client I felt like it did everything that it needs to. But now when I'm on the other side and I actually need to work with lots of clients, right? I see that the variety of needs is huge, and then there's there's just so much to do. Whether that's a new innovation or just kind of a fixing thing or or adding gaps or filling the gaps, uh, the use cases are just huge. That was that was kind of the key learning. If you just look at the panel, right? Like the we, you know, Sandra, Igor, and I, we just represent so different kind of approach to the same problem or to very similar problems that it's it's a really nice demonstration of that. Indeed, indeed, and I I, I will be very interested also in in understanding like how you relate it to this. But maybe we can uh, put it into a later question, and and maybe I can ask like let's let's do ladies last now. Uh, <laughs> So I can ask Igor to also share uh, what was his experience when, when joining SmartCat after a couple of months? What, what was the big learning? Yeah, uh, again, like uh, I just have half a year experience at, at SmartCat, uh, working at SmartCat, uh, but uh, it looks like I've been here forever. And I actually uh, knew about SmartCat and really liked the company even before I joined. Uh, I joined it. So when I was uh, researching my options where to go next after my previous gig, uh, I proactively reached out to SmartCat and uh, explained my vision of what we can do uh, with the product. Um, SmartCat by itself is a great platform to uh, to work with different customers. And here I'm pretty much echoing what Martin was saying before. Uh, me joining a company from the end client side where I was tailoring our solutions to specific uh, needs of one company uh, and then going on the, to a larger scale, understanding different needs uh, of different end customers of various sizes from smaller ones to enterprises, understanding the needs of freelancers, of LSPs. Like this is a whole different new ecosystem and universe of people who are working on localization. And I had to uh, like really uh, quickly try to understand different positions of different people who are using the product because otherwise you are not uh, being able to um, provide like proper uh, like proper solutions when they are tailored to just one specific niche. Though I have some specialization at SmartCAD, uh, one of the key learnings is that like this whole space is so much more diver diverse than I imagined that uh, while being at, at Evernote. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting uh, note. And Sandra? Yeah, for me, diversity perhaps is also one of the keywords because uh, when you um, research um, prototype test solutions on the market, you always understand that uh, you're solving just only a particular need of a particular uh, persona because in every company, uh, there are many different uh, infrastructures or workflows uh, when it comes to uh, translation management for developers, for marketing, for legal people, for communication or customer support. And what was the most surprising discovery for me uh, on the marketing and communication side uh, is the mindset and, and the change of it uh, within the innovative companies and, and the young teams, because um, where for many of them, like traditional principles of um, of translation services are not longer suited. So uh, we all hear about the progress in AI, neural uh, networks, machine that very soon we will get the technology to translate instantly, to roll out content much more quickly without involving um, people, LSPs, connections, and, and building up the processes that uh, require a lot of uh, human touch there. So, and this is um, this is a question that always arises: uh, where are we in terms of uh, of the quality and the technology progress? And it's extremely interesting to see how um, 
innovative companies uh, and teams are trying to test out the methods in content creation to make it better translatable and localized faster in different markets. So for me, this is one of the heuricas that uh, we are really getting there. Then I think it's it's also like, um, it has not been said very explicitly, but uh, one thing that I've seen in the last couple of years is that there has been way more focus on enterprise translation management than before, on enterprise as opposed to translators, as opposed to SLVs. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. So is that uh, like over the last couple of years, uh, have enterprises been pushed to the center of the attention for the TMS developers uh, or, or do you see differently? Uh, let's go, uh, let's say like Martin, Sandra, Igor. No, I would definitely agree with that. I think you're completely right. Uh, it was also uh, in the kind of the mem source strategy or the focus at the beginning was actually on the on the agencies, the LSPs. And just about four years ago, we started focusing on the enterprises. And I think it's just that LSPs sort of needed the tools from the very beginning. It's their button, you know, bread and button, or whatever you say. Uh, you got me. Uh, but uh, for enterprises, I remember about maybe 12 years ago at my previous uh, job when, when the uh, localization manager said that he needs a TMS, we were like, you need what? Uh, and then so you, it was still something that, you know, was kind of a new acronym. And it took a while, years, before this became well-justified tool within enterprises. So I think it's just that the market is growing and that's why there's the shift in the focus. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, Martin, and uh, also bringing in the other side of the metal. Um, because we have had uh, not many but few use cases with uh, large enterprises and, um, and for example, Apple, HP or PricewaterhouseCoopers, who I can recount recently, um, it's extremely complicated to um, integrate successfully uh, TMS solutions on the uh, headquarters level because when it comes to each and every country, um, managing still partly their translations uh, on the local level, which actually works better compared to, to arranging all the processes somewhere abroad and trying to, to onboard those teams all over the world. So, so I think uh, definitely there's a lot of um, help that they, um, on the enterprise level that they can get from the solutions, but still, um, still integrating and onboarding like the the uh, teams all over the world is is a big issue that we can see. So, for example, in Sweden, uh, team uh, within Apple, they they still do manually all the work that comes to translation uh, for the distributors locally. And that was just one of the projects that we were trying to help them. And I was also um, asking myself that well, how complicated it was on the headquarters level to arrange uh, things in a way that uh, locally they could provide, for example, support for their customers or marketing communication uh, from the central TMS. Yeah, Sandra brought a good point. Uh, at SmartCat, uh, we're also looking at enterprise customers as our model customers. And uh, the reason is that uh, like you might want to think that starting small and then expanding to larger customers is like the more logical way to go. But the larger the enterprise customer is, the more it looks like a bunch of smaller customers with totally different needs who sometimes even don't know who uh, like who is going who is doing what on the other side of the office, for example. So tailoring for enterprise customers allows you to also tailor for smaller teams who need uh, who have those different needs, but also have this overall um, understanding on how to work uh, and how to integrate those things together in a more cohesive space and allow you to to do something more with um, with different types of localization that happen at, at enterprises. So going after enterprises allows you to actually cover smaller teams as well, but also uh, have this like f like vision, like overall uh, overarching vision of how to to deal with uh, with any scale, basically. I, I love these comments, and as a matter of fact, with some uh, like like what Sandra was explaining, I was on with my Nimzi hat on. I was working with one of the large multinationals uh, who were managing all the marketing locally 
And even if the central translations team was trying to, to make sure that they got all the support for this, there's a lot of pushback. And they also wanted independence. And this is probably not a technology thing, but rather more a, a personal agenda thing. And this makes me wonder, like, I don't think that end customers is a, uh, a properly defined segment or a properly uh, addressable thing. I mean, you cannot, you cannot create a, uh, a buyer persona or something at an end customer because one end customer is so different from another. And what I would love to understand is what are those factors? What are those things in, in your companies or in your product design that you take into account when imagining different end customers? Who wants to go first? Mm, I can go for a change. Um, so um, at SmartCat, we uh, for sure uh, like put uh, our customer profile and customer profiles in different bu buckets to be able to address them better. Uh, two of the large buckets that I would uh, identify here is what we call ideal customers and like more like casual buyers. Uh, ideal customers are the ones that uh, understand the needs of automation and they already have some automation in place in their companies. So we're looking at software companies, um, e-learning, e-commerce, um, companies, uh, the the clients that produce content at scale and they want to automate and scale things up. So these are uh, the ones who already understand the, uh, the potential of automation and they are seeking for those solutions. While others, uh, the more casual ones, are the ones that just have a like pressuring need to to localize their website, their blog. They probably do not know about TMS at all. They don't know about the landscape. They just have a specific need that they want to address and they're researching different tools and looking at how to use those tools to, to solve their particular problem. So these are different customers that we need to address differently that uh, that have uh, different different vision and different understanding of the of the landscape, of the technology landscape and TMS landscape. Yes. Within ideal customers, we have different personas as well. We have technical people who like essentially developers or people with engineering mindset who uh, absolutely understand what automation is and they, they have a particular idea on how to integrate things with their systems. And again, there are some people who are non-technical coming from linguistic background who are more interested in the management side of things. So we need to uh to cater to those, to those both so yeah it, it becomes like more and more diversified as you as you're trying to analyze them uh like the behaviors of people uh and it's like a really interesting and challenging thing to do to kind of uh make sure that the platform suits the needs of all those different types of personas well that's actually a very interesting uh point that you're saying because when you're talking about the ideal customers I can't help thinking about, and maybe my colleagues at NIMSI won't like me for this, uh, common sense advisory's model of the localization maturity, uh, where basically it's the last stage, it's the most uh, transparent localization, they called it many years ago, that you are looking at as idea customers, right? So are you also catering through this? Because I, I'm getting the impression that with SmartCat, you are focusing on the very newcomers and the very sophisticated and not so much with the in-between. It's it's uh, like it's spread everywhere between the people who are just like wanting to translate things, and the only thing they they know is translation. They don't even probably know the word localization or like transcreation or anything else. And people who are already coming from other TMS and they are ex exploring and comparing things, and they are uh, they understand their needs, understand what tools uh, TMS can bring, and they are like actually comparing things like feature by feature so everything in between like there's like a whole lot of like spectrum of customers that are coming in some have partially automated solutions for their product but not so for marketing so they they know that they uh have they can have a decent way of you know uh, localizing their product in a more automated way but when we're asking them about marketing side of things they usually think that the only way to address that is to manually upload like documents for translation. So they never thought about automation in the aspect of um, localizing their website or random marketing materials or support site. 
uh, support materials. So we we have pretty much everyone on the spectrum. Cool. Uh, Sandra, you are coming from the marketing side. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I still remember the times when for me and uh, and the team that I was managing um, for international growth, such tools as SmartCAD or MemSource were, were too complex. Simply, we needed to uh, move faster. We didn't want to learn too much um, and, uh, and set up new integrations. So, so I, I recall this from Igor's talk that, uh, that some people are really making the next step towards automation from, from having just offline content or online on Google Drive. We really had folders on Google Drive. We were using Google Translate and uh, to get a blog post done in eight languages, we were just sharing with eight freelancers. Uh, and you can, you can see and track the changes when it's ready and then go live and, and promote. So I think that, um, uh, that there is still a huge mass of uh, companies and people who do the same pattern as I used to did. And so uh, we made a market research among, um, among, among communication and marketing people. And so um, still using the, the offline uh, content creation methods or, or online separately file by file um, is, um, is just an everyday uh, work task. And, uh, and worldwide, this number is huge. So I think that this is, uh, this is a huge amount of, uh, of people who are moving towards automation, but really slowly. So, um, and moving towards operations on the cloud. So, so for all of us three or four, it's, it's a lot of work, definitely. So we are, for us, the, the perfect um, uh, user persona is really the person who makes the first step towards automation to get um, all the translations organized in a, in a wiser way. Uh, to get all the people together on the same page without sending emails or, or communicating. And uh, this is where we, we stand um, probably with our simplicity uh, message um, stand out from, from the other solutions on the market. So you can, you can probably um, recon just a Google Translate experience with additional features and options and styling, um, but it's still the parallel editing the dashboard with uh, with translations and uh, and really for us there are so many different uh, user personas so we're still trying to define like who's who's the best one uh, in order for um, our solution to scale faster as well. I suppose it's also hard to say no at the stage of the company where where you are to somebody like being very interested so. I find it that the, the younger the company, the harder it is to say no, and the more it can be like drifted away, no? Uh, true, and we're trying to, to learn how to say no to different um, feature requests, because usually um, you, you, can, you can follow some pattern and, and try to go deeper, uh, or you can, you can just go wider with your product development. So this is yes extremely important to learn saying no. Cool. What is your experience with the different types of enterprise customers, Martin? I, I don't know if there's a like a categorization that you can apply to enterprise customers. It seems like everybody's different. <laughs> so it's, uh, there's probably patterns, I agree with that, but there's, there's a commonality. So I would say uh, a typical customer, typical uh, kind of a person or a customer that that would really uh, benefit from using MemSource is going to be a large IT organization, typically IT organization, but it doesn't have to be, but something large that has a pretty complex setups, right? Something that needs to be integrated into their ecosystem of other platforms that they use for authoring content, whether that's a content management system, doc, product documentation, or the software itself. Um, and uh, what you need is uh, something that is fully automated or ideally fully automated that takes it from that source, uh, is able to get it into the translation platform, do as much automation within the platform as well. So a lot of the, a lot of the tasks that the project managers uh, have to do 
would be automated. And then you only really manage the exceptions right, in an ideal scenario, right? So you come in in the morning and then it just tells you, okay, everything is running well. But then here, the due date is getting close. And here, maybe the file format got corrupted, you know, uh, get in touch with, you know, the source. And then uh, the project manager can automate as many tasks as possible. You know, the, the machine translation is yet another example of automation on the linguist's part right now, right? Because then they have to, you know, less work to do. So I think the automation is written everywhere. Uh, but yeah, our typical client would be more of a complex client uh, with the complex scenarios. Uh, but at the same time, we have a free edition, a personal edition. So uh, the editions that we have, there's about five different levels, uh, four paid, one, one kind of a free. So we don't, we, the number of users is still towards the lower, lower cost editions. But the clients that we work with the most are definitely the enterprises. And, and that's actually very interesting. Uh, we will return to this IT thing that you mentioned that the IT organizations, previously we were talking with Igor and he was mentioning also IT as in software, e-learning and e-commerce uh, providers. But before we get there, there is something that I wanted to, uh, to ask you. It's like, this relates to my past with MemoQ and, you know, in the first part of the 2020, 2010s, sorry, uh, we had this feature creep that we were adding more and more features and we saw every other company adding more and more feature. And right now what I see is that there is a shift towards the customer experience. Like for Sandra, for example, it was not a question whether the software was capable of doing what she wanted to do, but whether it was an overkill or not. So it seems that we are getting to a, a culture of, of saying no, as, uh, as we were talking about before. And I'm just wondering, like, how you are keeping your product simple? Uh, what are your main design principles that you are applying in order to keep it simple? Because also, if you are aiming for automation, I mean, if you're allowing for for parallel options, if you're allowing for, for uh, like a lot of configuration, automation kills that. Sorry, no, it kills automation, the other way around. <laughs> so whoever wants to take the answer first. I can, I can go. No, it's a, it's a very good question. This is a, this is a, I would say, typical product management question, right? You, you have it not only in our industry, but it's everywhere. How do you keep the product simple? That means saying some no, Right, uh, but at the same time, you know, it's more scalable, it's more maintainable, so it pays off uh, long term. Uh, I don't think that there is one one rule that I can give you that we would follow that basically solves this challenge. Right, you really need to go, and then with every future request or capability you're trying to add, um, you you need to be careful. You try to leverage as much as possible from the existing functionality, not no duplications. Right, uh, just trying to build on top of it uh, something that is simple. You need to, uh, from time to time, uh, do cleanup, right? So if, if you pile things up, like you see that there is some inconsistencies, uh, there's maybe something that gets too complicated because you, you're setting the options here, you're setting the options there and there, but really they should be all in one place. You just got there because you were developing them at different times. Right? So there's a lot of, uh, lot of uh, kind of a going back and then clean things up. Uh, but we do, you mentioned the user experience, we do pay a lot of attention to that. Our UX team, uh, I would say it's, it, this year it's going to be three times larger than it was in 2019. Uh, so, so that's uh, just kind of a testament uh, uh, that uh, the UX experience uh, makes a big difference. I would totally agree with that. And then we do a lot of research. So whenever there's a more complex uh, feature, like we're adding now uh, LQA to our product, and then that's a pretty complex stuff with a lot of personas, right? You need to, there's certain certain part that the linguists will do, certain part that the project manager will do, then then the managers, right? The localization managers that don't even work with the product, they need some reports, and then so that's a that's a pretty complex feature. So there was a there was a pretty extent. That's an example of very extensive UX research that we've done on this area, and we're still doing. Uh, it's a it's a project on multiple quarters, uh, so. As opposed to maybe just you know taking our best guess and then just adding it to the product and then without any validation with the users whether it makes sense for them or not. So yeah, definitely uh, something that is important. Then and we're keeping very close eye on that. 
Yeah, uh, I, I would probably uh, like just like hundred uh, percent repeat what Martin was saying because it's a more of a like general product manager question on how to deal with different requests and uh, feature creep. Uh, from me, like it, it, personally, it's it's always not doing something is more important than doing something. Uh, so just like stepping back and instead of rushing and implementing the first thing that comes into your mind, just understanding what how that fits into the overall vision of the product. And that's what we're trying to do at SmartCAD, um, making sure that we have this like North Star vision of where the product should be in terms of UI, in terms of serving our customers and how each specific feature, if, if feature uh, that is about to be implemented uh, fits into that. Or uh, if it doesn't, what we can offer our customers and probably educate them on the proper processes so that instead of actually adding this feature, they can improve their process and do something differently that in the long term will result in the better localization experience for them as well. Uh, without them having to have like every single way of like, like controlling the like translation UI or like tailoring that to their needs. Sometimes their requests come from their own personal experience of dealing with imperfect ways of like localizing things in the past. And they try to bring that into the platform that they um, that they are evaluating, be it SmartCat or, or anything else. And they try to like push you towards their vision, but you still have to have this like sharp focus on what the overall vision of the product is uh, and, and, and being, uh, you know, like, like strict to those, uh, to those principles. And my comments regarding um, the question, which originally was about simplicity and scalability, uh, as Martin and Igor explained it, um, through the product development, then, then I would bring in the, the business aspect. Uh, for me, simplicity means scalability. Uh, so the more um, uh, scalable products are, the more capital we bring into the translation or localization industry, right? So, um, and here, well, of course, the capital gives the resources to onboard more companies or build products in a more professional way. This is what I see from my side and where I keep an eye on uh, and try to analyze uh, why actually the number of investments, the funding rounds are pretty low. The, the capital that, that comes into translation industry uh, is, uh, is not sufficient from my point of view. We're having only a couple of uh, startups or like companies uh, in translation industry that were established less than 10 years ago <laughs> who are fresh and young who bring new blood in into this uh, industry so such names as unbubble not not many to mention who have raised more than 50 million and who are trying to change some aspect of the industry so this is where I see that there is a problem within the simplicity. It's, it's always the hardest to, to build the simple tools. So, and the industry at the same time as we discussed before is so segmented. So it's, uh, it makes it very hard to, to find the right segment that scales the best and to build there the simple product. <laughs> So this is where I, I feel that it's it's the biggest challenge for TranslateWise as well, because we are here aiming to raise capital and change the way a lot of people um, are, are still managing content in multiple languages or or automate the, the communication, multilingual communication. And perhaps uh, this is the topic that is that is close to my heart, how to bring more capital into this industry how to make simpler products and how to scale faster. So any investors, please shoot them, <laughs> Sandra. Uh, but I think that you have actually segued us to a very interesting topic, which I wanted to touch on because so far we were mostly talking about our personal feelings, personal experiences, but let's talk about the industry as well. I mean, I didn't start with that because we've got 90 minutes for this uh, discussion. And one of the things that's, that's, uh, that you said is that in the last 10 years, uh, not many companies, not many new companies uh, have, have seen the light uh, in translation, auto, uh, translation management. And I mean, 
my, uh, if correct me if I'm wrong, I think that uh, MemSource is from 2010. I think that uh, SmartLink is like 2014 or something. That's when uh, it was founded. And since then, I mean, no major um, company there. Like my belief is that it always takes three, four years, or it takes like seven years up to the three, four years for early adopters, seven years for a company to come to uh, the the main uh, uh, stage in in this industry. That's my personal experience. Like look at uh, other companies like like um, I don't know EDM back then. Look at Memsource. Look at MemoQ. So there were there were uh, there was always time passing, and it it needed for uh, refining the offering. But one thing that uh, is quite interesting these days is that there are lots of specialized tools. So those companies that were founded recently do not uh, try to reinvent the wheel. And I'm glad that you raised Ambabel because Ambabel is trying to uh, to do something for its very specific set of, uh, of customers. But on the other hand, uh, I have here a couple of, uh, of different uh, providers like, like Intento, which is uh, reasonably successful in machine translation uh, aggregation. Then there is Model Front, which is an empty quality um, prediction algorithm that is API only. Lexico, Lexica, an API only quality check. Uh, cross check, it's something that I just learned about yesterday. Content Quo is focusing fully on, on the quality uh, aspect of translation and doesn't care about TMS. So what I'm wondering is what your thoughts are, and, and also my company, Vilez, is, uh, is, is, is also a middleware, it's an integrator. We, we don't care which TMS, we just want to support the supply chain. And, and what I wanted to understand is like how you see... Uh, the future of the TMS. So I have a, an assumption that I would like to, to raise here. And I think that there is no one winner in the future in the TMS uh, space, but everybody is going to carve out their own niche. And uh, even within a company, if, if we agree with Igor, that uh, the bigger the company, the more it seems like a, a, a conjoint of smaller teams, uh, even within the same company, it is likely that you will find more than one TMS uh, being used. I would love to hear your thoughts about this. Okay, so I, I can probably start. Um, well, first of all, it's it's really great to see those niche products popping up in different uh, parts of the industry because I believe this is how the industry is moving forward. You are trying to push and do something new in a very specific niche. And that really expands the our understanding of what's possible in that specific niche. And then probably larger companies, larger TMS, um, look at that and try to accommodate some of the things. And probably new TMS uh, are being like created right now as we're speaking. Um, and they would be uh, like basically standing on the shoulders of uh, not the giants, but th those smaller companies who really try to uh, to push the needle and to move the needle and uh, invent some creative ways of dealing with different sorts of uh, different types of localization, right? Uh, TMSs are really um, products that are uh, that have lots of code, lots of uh, different tools inside. So it's not a simple thing to do, right? And this is why you are not seeing larger like all-in-one TMSs uh, being uh, released like every year. It's it's really easier to to do to to uh, to work with smaller products. Um, sometimes uh, larger companies uh, try to do their own TMS solutions, right? And uh, if you are specifically if you are not coming from a linguistic side of things, you don't know what TMS is. Sometimes it's um, like you, you feel that it's really easy for your company to build some TMS, some sort of solution for yourself, uh, but you don't realize how diverse the uh, the space is and how many things are needed to be done in order to actually improve, like significantly improve the quality of like localization overall. So there's um, 
I, I, I can see the trend going that uh, many companies specifically in like media localization will be um, like or, or solutions being created. And uh, this is one of the things that actively grows, for example. Uh, but at the same time, there is a benefit of having an all-in-one solution that uh, allows you to efficiently reuse uh, the linguistic tools, the the assets, the way you are paying your uh, your linguist, for example. It doesn't matter where your content comes from if it goes into a single system where you can track the efficiency, where you can lower the cost of translation by reusing translations from, from multiple sources. That's one of the benefits of uh, all-in-one tools. So um, I, I would say that people will be going from uh, niche products to larger ones or being looking into seamlessly integrating those smaller things into larger TMSs just for the benefits of payments and all sorts of other automation that can be seen on, on, on larger platforms. So that like th these are different trends, but I, I really enjoy seeing very creative uh, like startups and, and products who are trying to focus on very specific thing or specific customers and and try to do interesting, uh, like really interesting innovative solutions that uh, the industry as a whole can benefit from. And for me, it seems that most of the solution that you mentioned, yes, they are interesting. Uh, they make sense to many companies, but they're still a niche. So. For me personally, I'm waiting for Uber for freelance translators or, or something huge in the industry because I can feel that there's the demand, especially um, 2020, the pandemic showed that the, the internet, multilingual internet is, is a place of huge opportunities. Many companies are moving there even faster than they used before and investing into, into translating their products um, more perhaps than um, than previously. Uh, what I am also exciting to see, besides um, that, I believe that hundreds of uh, TMS solutions uh, will stay on the market. So, so the market will not be changing that fast. But um, for example, Mailchimp, Marketo, uh, Medium, and platforms where currently. Um, the content creation takes part that either have some connectors to popular TMS systems, will they be building something um, into their solutions uh, for multilingual content management, for multilingual content creation? Um, this is something that I'm, I'm really looking forward to because uh, uh, today mostly we are uh, used to talk about integrating TMS with uh, some other tools um, or some other type of legacy systems, creating our own integration connection points, uh, but also like seeing some large platforms building their own multilingual solutions, or maybe there's a place for mergers and acquisitions of uh, other players on the markets, smaller TMS uh, providers uh, that can scale within Medium, for example. Um, so probably this is like something uh, where we could see uh, not just a niche product, but also like something spreading really fast worldwide. To, to add something, I'll, I'll maybe take a little bit different angle on it. I definitely see the need and I'm excited about all the innovation that is going on in our industry. Uh, I, I want to kind of highlight that uh, any industry uh, needs also somebody, some of the bigger players who combine things together and make more kind of a complete and holistic solutions, right? And I'll give a really good example from a different industry and that's a content management. So everybody knows Adobe for the creative products, Photoshop and all of that, right? But about, I will say about maybe 10, 12 years ago, they got into the marketing area. They, they, they acquired content management system company, then acquired analytic company, analytics, then target uh, targeting uh, in marketing, and then uh, campaign management. And they all combined that together into the marketing suite, now marketing cloud. And then they made it within a few years, multi-billion dollar uh, product line, right? Because every VP of marketing, when they saw that they can purchase from a single company platform that does all of it, and they don't need to talk to the internal ITs about all the integration and then you know putting things together and then 
the not knowing if the issue between integrating the product is issue with that company or that company's product, it just simplified the world. So, uh, you know, a lot of them were like, that's the product that I need, right? And then they become number one, they became leader in that area. And that's because there was a huge value add, the fact that it seamlessly put, you know, different functions together. And I think something like that needs to happen within translation management as well. And maybe beyond translation management, it just needs to grow maybe into, into adjacent areas. Uh, but we do need um, the larger solutions that can solve the complex problems because that's what the large enterprises need, right? And especially now when everybody's downsizing the ITs and they're just buying basically, not even buying products and installing them, just sort of renting them, right? It's all subscription-based today, ideally. You don't, you don't want to deal with any of that. You just create an account and within minutes you can you can you know, run the show. So there's definitely a trend into simplifying it. You talk about it, uh, Ishtan, earlier, like the user experience. And then the same thing is on the IT end as well. So. Uh, yeah, we, we do need to we do need to make sure that it doesn't stay fragmented, right? Otherwise, it's it's just gonna, we're going to miss a lot of opportunities there. Actually, a super interesting question. I mean, this is uh, very much relating to the to the issue of integrations, which everybody talks about these days. And one thing that you mentioned uh, here, Martin, was that uh, companies like to buy from a single provider, and that is, I believe more for the uh, legal or for the responsibility perspective than it is for a, for, a, for a product perspective, because I have actually seen situations where one company was selling two different products and they were less integrated than another company with one of these products. So I've seen uh, that before. So I, I, whenever I hear somebody saying that if it's sold by the same company, then it's better integrated than whatever else is in the market. I would uh, very much protest against this, and there is no evidence whatsoever, even though it sounds like very logical. But what I'm very curious about is how you guys see, like, who is responsible for making sure uh, that there is like a, a full solution for uh, the customer. So there is a customer who needs a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of video localization, a bit of continuous localization for software, a bit of uh, translation management and works with um, internal translators as well, let's say. Who puts it together if there is nothing on the market? I can point a finger at myself. <laughs> so this is um, basically a step-by-step -step mission of um, active founders who have the clear vision, who are able to, first of all, deliver the product on the market, find the first product market fit, raise capital and constantly um, develop products with exactly this mission in mind. Because today I already understand, okay, we are able to combine multilingual uh, chat and customer support, multi multilingual email campaigns, uh, multilingual blogs and some, some other um, areas of marketing into one, but definitely we're not able to uh, to add their um, apps or, or software localization um, uh, workflows as it's just it just lies on a totally different aspect. So we're, we're working on a long form text uh, 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 content creation management and everywhere that it's needed. Probably string-based um, uh, approach is totally different, so, so we still cannot bring everything together. But at least, like when I was mentioning the, the MailChimp, Marketo, or, or some, uh, some other platforms, I believe that it's possible the way in, in a part of the way to um, achieve the united uh, or, or some combination of uh, those uh, products platforms that currently are segmented, even within the same company, different teams are using different workflows and different providers and suppliers. So at least like, let's try <laughs> from our side to, uh, to combine some pieces together. Perhaps it will already um, show some, some significant growth uh, um, of the of the solution of the infrastructure within the industry. Thank you. Anybody has anything to add? Yeah, I can, I can definitely add to that. Um, 
my my point on that is that it's never possible to uh, integrate everything with everything, right? Uh, it's like too much of a job and uh, trying to look at this as uh, like building connectors from one proprietary system, like content management system to another proprietary system, which is a TMS, um, will solve your particular needs here and there for a specific company, but then uh, it's it's a road to nowhere, uh, right? You're fixing your specific problem right here, right now, and a year from now, a new system um, appears that you want to use in your company and you have to do it from scratch, right? <clears throat> so at SmartCat, we're looking at this, uh, that this should be a... Mm, kind of like a move from both directions. We not only are building a TMS solution just to like do the localization, we're building a platform where which is easier to integrate with. For example, with our automation layer, uh, you don't have to build a connector that works with SmartCat as a proprietary TMS. You can build a part of the connector from your uh, CMS solution that is only responsible for importing and exporting content. And from there, we already offer you half of the connector that allows you to easily digest this information and bring that into our TMS and then um, like give you the localized content that you can then import back into your solution. So these things are scalable because uh, if every solution at least works on their part of the job, uh, providing nice export and import tools and have localization in mind. And this is something that we need to educate everybody and we're trying to educate this, um, like um, our customers and other companies who want to integrate with us. So if everybody's doing their part of the job, then it becomes much more easier to actually build those uh, like proper seamless integrations between multiple pieces. Uh, there's unfortunately there's no like industry-wide standard on like exchanging content between systems, so uh, we're at least trying to do our job as a TMS platform to be able to easily digest different things from from different places. Okay, uh, Martin, if you want to say something, um, you don't have to. Okay, sorry. Yeah, just... Very quickly, just very quickly. It's it's again the situation where there's a huge variety. We've got. Actually, more than half of the content that gets into uh, MemSource is done is, is, is kind of imported through APIs. So you, that, that tells you, that's a big statement, right? That tells you that there's a lot of typically enterprise customers, but not only enterprise because everybody has access to the API, but but it, it shows the need for the integration, right? And then the automation and that there's a demand for it and they're willing to invest and then code against our APIs to get it in. Um, so that's an example where a lot of the Lot of the responsibility or it's in the hands of the clients right they, they like to do it themselves those that are sort of uh, on the other side of the spectrum they want as much as uh, uh, as much of the solution out of the box they really reach out for uh, maybe the out of the out of the box integrations that we have with about 30 systems and then they they really you can tell that even though that maybe with a little tweak uh, they could make the connected to work anyway or the plugin work any way that they want, they still kind of rely on one us to do that. So their expectations are very different from the other companies. And there's a lot of and a lot of in between. Um, so quite quite difficult to answer with a simple I don't think there is like one answer. Like it really depends. It's actually like um, I mean, we were talking about uh, Sandra was talking about companies like Market to like what if they took over let's say uh, also the the translation which I think would be uh, a mistake, but other than that, uh, they could actually. What Marketo did is that they were they were teaming up very much with CloudWords. I don't know if that still exists, but a couple of years ago, I know that majority of the revenue of CloudWords was actually coming from Marketo's uh, referrals. And but one of the things that that uh, I started thinking about is that people talk about headless CMSs. Basically, those CMSs that are are not having a single user interface, not having a single anything, but they are doing the logic. Because what we do is translation memory management. I mean, the translation memory is still very central. It can be corpus-based. It can include terminology. It can include a lot of other things. But in reality, the indexing, the quick retrieval, um, the these these are like very basic functionalities of, of any TMS today. 
And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are regarding headless DMS, whether that ever uh, crossed the minds in a, something a bit more than, uh, than just a thought. And probably with Igor, uh, with, his, with his search, uh, he will have a little more to say here than the others. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, like CMS being headless or having a head uh, somewhere there, uh, it doesn't really change the landscape of, you know, like, uh, or like this doesn't simplify or make it more complex to localize things. It's more about whether a specific solution that you're using, again, like with the CMS, it could be uh, like marketing campaign, like mailing system or support system like Zendex, like anything, right? Uh, it's it's more about whether this system has some some notion of multilingual uh, content capabilities built in, or you if you have to build or invent some some workarounds on top of this thing to make it work for multilingual content. So there are headless CMSs that have no idea of multilingual content and will be really a pain in the ass to integrate them with any TMS out there. There are some. Uh, some some companies and some solutions that uh, really thought about multilingual user experience and they have this built in. And then based on, uh, on top of that, it's it's all about how you're, uh, like what are the tools or APIs that you are providing uh, out of the box to be able to easily uh, export the content for localization and then bring that back in. Some uh, some solutions have their own like APIs and they are like database driven and they they provide like real platforms that, that you can use uh, out of the box. Some are file based, for example, they're more like developer oriented. These are easier to work with if, they, if you already have a set of files that represent your content, it's really easy to deal with this content the same way you're dealing with localizing the software product, right? So these are the differentiators where you are uh, where some of the products are easier to work with and some require additional steps to make it um, mm, to make them multilingual. So uh, if you are in the market of like choosing a specific tool, first of all, you need to understand what they are offering in terms of APIs, in terms of content storage, uh, whether you can really export and Im import things and whether they have this notion of multilingual content because they, if they don't, uh, you will have to implement this by yourself and and have your own custom solution then then probably will not be compatible with like different connectors or stuff or, thing, or other things. You'll have to invent uh, things on your own. I'm, I'm sorry, but just uh, a little bit of uh, getting this right. So what I was more meaning is a headless TMS rather than a headless CMS here. So uh, oh, if, for example, Marketo wants to create something which relates to the localization, uh, why wouldn't they go and, and integrate uh, something that's out there in the market? Uh, we always believe that we are like a small uh, technology industry, uh, but, but we always believed that uh, we had to have the full translation under our control. So is that something that uh, you think is like, there is a, a very particular reason why we need to offer like very thorough TMSs, big things to the market rather than just some components uh, for translation or like what's your your perspective? So like headless CMS is, is a new concept to me. Uh, well, uh, at some uh, at some point you can, you can say that automation automation layer without the actual TMS UI is a headless TMS, but that would be a stretch for me. Like TMS by itself is something that uh, individual linguists and reviewers need to work with. So there's there's some UI right uh, there, right? But it's, it's all about how you are, um, like defining the the responsibilities, you can you can build your integration in a way that is tied to a specific TMS. So you are locked into a specific vendor, and it's really hard for you to change a TMS if you if you like ever decide to. Uh, and another approach is to be more TMS agnostic. So build in some um, like some logical separation between your uh, your code or your uh, your content management system, your content storage, and do something that will allow you to switch to a different TMS if needed. So that's that's something that larger companies and enterprises actually like mm, like gear, gearing towards to because they don't want to be in the position when they are fully 
locked into a specific solution and they don't even uh they, they can't even like build their software without like mm, asking as a third party provider to provide them the resource files for the, for their for for their builds right so uh, they do those uh like logical separations uh and implement some internal solutions uh like what i can say about uh, smartcat is that our automation is built with this separation like logical separation in mind and you can run automation on premises on your side or uh, on our side if you want to uh, and it really gives you a peace of mind um, when it comes to like automating things because you technically can run automation even without talking to smartcat servers and it's done like locally within your like build infrastructure any other thoughts on this or shall we move on um, really, I think quick, like when you said that, when you asked the question, my first kind of a thought was, well, how exactly do we define headless TMS, right? Like we, we have a pretty good feel, I think, all for headless CMS, even that has a UI, of course, uh, it's just that the retrieval, typically the delivery is done through APIs. Um, so I, I've mentioned that more, you know, that's, I think my best definition I can think of at this moment I know it's evening, so maybe in the morning I'll have a better, but you know, at this moment is sort of that the UI is getting sort of deprioritized and a lot of the uh, work is done through APIs, right? So it becomes sort of a headless. And then I think I'll just go back to that stat that I've mentioned that we definitely see that uh, happening. Uh, more than half of the content that we that is getting through uh, MemSource is through APIs. Actually, our number one client, number one customer, is sort of using us uh, in a headless mode uh, almost, uh, with the exception of the cat. The cat is, oh, you need that, right? Without that, you're not able to localize. But the project management piece, where everything is getting aggregated, translation memories, uh, all of that is, is done through the API. So, uh, there's definitely a need for it, and we see this being pretty popular. It's, it's still not headless, though, right? So you you mentioned that you need this like management by exception, but you need this management. You need to see what's going on right. there, right? So right. there's there's still some UI. Going back to the definition, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now the UI is always very interesting, and one of the things like I think it's also time for us to talk a bit about these development-oriented TMSs, given that MemSource has recently made an announcement uh, regarding the acquisition of. Uh, a tool called Phrase, which is one of the development-oriented TMSs in the market. Like the others are are like like Poodle, Localize, uh, Crowdin, and and Transifex, and maybe some some others as well. Um, and I don't know if if uh, Surge is somehow related to this or or not, but it's addressing similar uh, problems. And one of the things that I found quite interesting uh, is that. You can actually create also, for example, when you're when you're moving into a software design uh, infrastructure like Sketch or Figma, where the designers are creating the software result, like a graphical uh, look and feel of, of of what they're doing, it's possible to have a plugin that is extracting everything from there and that is generating the resource files. And if I look back like 10 years ago, everybody was uh, like getting the resource files in and ready for translation. And this has made the, um, the collaboration on the source content so much more complicated. The other thing is that in many TMSs, you cannot have the same source language as the target language, and simply TMSs don't really offer a way to, to edit the source content. And in, I've seen also companies where some is translated from, because of the legal needs, some uh, stuff is translated, let's say, from US English, whereas other stuff is translated from UK English, given that uh, the UK English used to be a, a language which was more uh, like like uh, referring to the to the European Union legislation. Not sure what's going to be the future. Maybe they change the language. But I'm just I'm just curious. Like, is there a gap? Like, I mean, the general TMSs are able to localize software. So you all have uh, the different file filters for JSON, for YAML, for PO files, for whatever. Uh, but why is this a very special uh, niche 
And, and why were these development-oriented TMS is not closer to the, to the general TMSs earlier? I don't know who wants to go first. If, uh, uh, oh. Marky, you paid a lot of money for being able to go first. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, no, that's a, that's a really good question. And um, I, think, I think that I would almost want to turn it around that question, right? Like, you know, we, we started with the technology. It was technology questions, like why there's niches and different tools. And I think I think I'd almost like to see it from the opposite direction, which is there's certain needs that the that the, these teams that they have, right? And then the you know mentioned phrase, we acquired phrase, we announced it on Monday. So the common scenario there is that you've got a, a development team, and the development team is developing a product that needs to be inter, in, internationalized. I would say, you know, you need to go global, and then uh, in order for that, you need some place where you manage the strings, the UI strings, right? Uh, you need some place where you localize them efficiently. It's a, it's a continuous localization workflow, of course, because that's how the development works today. This is all continuous deployment. Uh, so it needs to kind of fit in into that. And at that moment, if I was a team like that, I wouldn't be looking for a general purpose TMS that is just, just this big truck that can do lots of other things, right? I would pick a tool that focuses on that niche that can do just that, right? Very lightweight. And that's uh, exactly what these uh, tools are. But overall, as maybe the company or the team is growing, or maybe they're joining forces with another department within the enterprise, if it's a small team within an enterprise like marketing team, then the needs keep growing and maybe they want to unify. The use cases are wider. Now you need to do documentation, you need to do maybe marketing content, right? Websites, and then your needs are growing. So you, you do need more general purpose TMS like Memsource. Memsource can do software localization as well, of course. We've got uh, connectors to, you know, to Git, Figma plugin, Sketch plugin, and all of that. We've got continuous localization features as well. But getting it from the beginning for like a smaller use case would be probably an overkill, right? Uh, so so uh, we, we joined the forces because, because this will widen the number of use cases that we can cover, you know, with our product portfolio. And then uh, it's nice, like for me as a product uh, manager, it's really awesome whenever there's a question, we can say, yes, we can do this. So now kind of feel like we can say more, more of a yes, we can do this as opposed to no, we can't really do that, right? Uh, the phrase, of course, has some capabilities that Memsource doesn't. Like if you do some of the uh, over-the-air kind of features, the mobile development, and then that's that's a pretty that's a very a very you know phrase is very strong in that Memsource. Obviously, is not going to verticalize in that area. We still want to stay more of a general purpose that covers wide range of use cases. Yeah, I can I can I can probably add to that that. Uh... I'm I'm personally an engineer. I have an engineering background, not a localization background. And in general, when I am tasked and, and the developer is tasked uh, with, uh, like, th they have a task of localizing their software, they, they don't uh, care about localization as much and they don't know about what TMS, like a larger TMS can offer. Uh, translation memories, like machine translation, they they don't understand any of that. Glossaries, style guides, they just need, they have a very specific need of throwing uh, the source like content somewhere and then getting localized things uh, back and then like, boom, they, they have a localized product, right? So uh, when they are shopping for the, for the tools, it's always compelling to go with something simpler that actually says like, hey, we are developer friendly instead of going after a large solution that has everything for for, ling for the linguist uh, to provide quality translation, but at the same time, feels like an overkill for a like software team. So that's why developer-oriented uh, tools are thriving. And um, another thing is that even if you have some automation in place in your TMS and uh, have a connector to a GitHub or something, Sometimes uh, it's still not enough to be able to really scale and do uh, localization at the speed of development. Uh, it requires a bit of a change of the uh, approach to localization and continuous localization specifically, because like many people think about continuous localization and, and like imagine it differently. Um, most uh, developer-friendly solutions they allow for like real continuous 
uh, delivery and discovery of the new content, deliver it back without developers having to do pretty much anything besides like a simple integration. So this is this is that specific niche that um, that I feel resonates with with smaller teams, and this is why those tools are possible. But in the end. Uh, I believe we are getting there uh, where larger TMSs start to think about like this, um, like real continuous localization approach, which is really scalable and avoids like fragmentation of different translation job, jobs, et cetera. And uh, eventually I think larger companies, larger products will catch up with that and be able to offer this continuous localization, not only for developer friendly formats, but for any any sort of content. Yeah, for me, it makes a lot of sense uh, what what Igor said. And although we're not focused on on developers, what, what I see is that um, this there are a couple of dilemmas uh, that exist um, in, in the industry. So interoperability uh, is definitely one of them, uh, and also translation memory, whether. Uh, people who create translation memories, uh, mostly professional uh, translators, uh, are they ready to share theirs to get some value back? And the same um, is valid for TMS because it has some stickiness in their DNA. It's not easy to switch the service providers or, or uh, to just take all your files and, and move to another platform. So here it's uh, probably uh, maybe because of uh, me just not having um, that advanced experience yet in the industry, I don't see the interoperability as a trend. And regarding translation memory, it's, uh, it's pretty similar. It's just not um, the priority uh, for the discussion with most of the of the people within companies, or if, if I take our use cases. So it's it's more or less, as you Igor said, that's, that the end value is uh, is in focus. And the, the rest is process, the rest is like, if, if you're talking about glossary, oh, okay, this is just a technicality, right? That's actually, that's a really, really good one. And I mean, it leads us also to, like we've, we've spoken here an hour and 20 minutes and we haven't mentioned translators which is a bit sad, isn't it? Uh, and, and like when you mention interoperability, I mean, that's something that we've seen this industry doing good interoperability a couple of years ago, but it seems that all the focus has now shifted to the enterprise. Uh, like there is way more focus in staying in the same tool and getting translators, which in a way with continuous localization with like uh, the, the localization size getting the text size getting shorter and the style guide size getting way longer than ever before. Previously, it was the opposite normally. Um, I think that this is uh, calling for a different uh, addressing of the translators because translators become partners. They are a bit closer to what used to be the in-house translators, uh, even if they are freelance than let's say 10 years ago. So how do you see all, all the translators and also the LSPs or also the supply chain a bit? Uh, how do you see all that in, in, in this very complicated system of challenges? Let's try to make complicated things simpler tonight <laughs> or this morning. Um, well, I see um, it rather an optimistic picture for uh, LSPs and uh, and for freelance translators as companies and people who are just seeking for automation and technologies to help them out in their um, complex processes. So for me, the industry in general has a huge demand and continues growing. So there's probably not a huge risk for, for LSPs or freelance translators to uh, sit and wait or, or look for the job. So. Uh, I rather mentioned in the beginning that what was surprising for me uh, is that there is a place for probably um, a new method or, or new style in involving humans into uh, processes where technologies already uh, do quite a large piece of the job that 
translators used to do more. So we're, we're still relying on machine translation, on machine learning, and on glossaries and translation memories. So uh, the proofreading, the localization part can be made more efficiently. Also, that was the reason why partly joking, I said Uber for uh, to join all the freelance translators because the user wants to have their content proofread and ready to be published in one click. So without even integrating any, any systems or learning to use some, some complex solutions. Even though um, a lot of translation agencies, large ones have integrated a smooth online ordering and billing process, it's still far away from the content. So I would personally love to have this button and this opportunity where I create content. So, so for me, there's still a place for human translators, for professionals who should be involved in the process. To add to that, so you mentioned that we did not discuss uh, the needs of uh, like end translators. Um, and this is a really like sad uh, like reality in the industry that uh, translators usually are not buyers, right? Uh, they don't have any say in what tools they're using. And usually this comes from a company that they are working with. So they basically dictate the, the set of tools that they, that individual linguists or like proofreaders have to, have to use. Um, and this is, uh, this is true for most TMSs, but at SmartCast, since we're building this uh, like all-in-one platform where individual freelancers can go and like find their like next work and like meet with their customers, um, we are like by definition are trying to cater to this specific audience. We recognize that and we're trying to make sure that those freelancers have a good experience in our product in the first place, because uh, in many cases, those people are bringing in the end customers, the buyers. So um, uh, this is a good like win-win situation, I believe for us, because uh, we're essentially building what, what Sandra was saying an Uber for translation, where you have this marketplace, where you have multiple uh, language service providers or individual freelancers and end customers all being in the same space uh, and be able to deliver their project quickly, find, find the workforce, uh, like evaluate linguists, etc. So we have to be that platform that is not only suitable for end customers who are buying the subscriptions, right? But also uh, catering to individual linguists so they feel uh, at home with our product and they can probably start with some smaller things, but then uh, if they have a customer on the, of their own, they can bring them into the platform. So this is where these like economy of scales, um, you know, uh, comes into equation. And this is what we're betting on uh, different uh, companies, LSPs, freelancers, bringing in other types of personas, our, other types of customers into our platform. And through that, we are able to offer uh, different, uh, like lo lo lots of, um, lots of workforce for end customers and lots of work for, for freelancers and LSPs. No, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a interesting. I'm going to comment only on part of this because I think you all said it, uh, but it is so from the localization in terms of localization tools, this is one of the more mature area, right? Like if you, if you look at the tools that were available 10 years ago, sorry, 20 years ago, then you had already CAT tools available on the market, right? Like if you take some of the big big players then. So over the two decades, it certainly matured a lot. And then if you compare that to maybe uh, other areas within the whole like localization, maybe the, maybe the project management part, and that's, that's not as mature, right? The project managers still don't have maybe tools to make the right decisions, like what is the right workflow for this document, right? So there's templates maybe, but you know, if they had additional analytical data, they would be making better decisions. They can't do that today, right? So, so the the CAD tools are pretty mature today, um, but at the same time, like the there's a trend. There are trends, right? Things are changing. Whether that's machine translation being pretty disruptive for the work uh, of the of the linguists, or even even the fact uh, that the the words, the segments, or the job size is getting smaller and smaller. I actually posted uh, a couple of months ago on on my LinkedIn account, uh, nice kind of a long tail, and then you could in some stats, and then I, if I remember that correctly, I think around forty four 
percent of all jobs that we get is less than 100 words. And then I would say 55% was like less than 200 words. So more than half, right, is, is somewhere maybe around like 170 words or something like that. That's pretty small. And then so that also uh, put some uh, emphasis on how the tools should work, right? Uh, the jobs are some, the, sometimes the jobs are so small that it's not even worth it to almost like open to sit down to your computer and open that, right? Uh, you just spend too much time on that. Uh, we have the mobile application, for example, that actually is getting pretty good traction. Like if you need to localize something on the go, you can actually do that through a mobile application from, from the bus. Um, but uh, okay, so we, we need to make sure that the um, tools are evolving as the trends are changing. Right, so this is a good example. More collaboration, certainly we're seeing more demand. Like one of the things we're seeing is more demand for collaboration between the linguist or linguist and the project manager. So we're developing you know, some, some improvements in that area as well. Um, so that's, uh, that's I would agree that we, we, we didn't talk about it until now. And then, uh, but it's certainly something that we shouldn't forget about. And there's, there's a lot of investments that we're we're putting in there too. We've got uh, we have multiple product teams uh, for the linguistic experience working on that. It's all super interesting, and I'm really sorry that we are getting to the end of this conversation because I have at least 15 different questions here <laughs> noted, and I wanted to talk a bit about with you about about reporting using. Uh, business intelligence using automation tools such as Zapier and others, which have made uh, the Google tools quite efficient in, in many respects. Uh, a bit more about the supply chains, uh, also different source contexts. So for like legal translation being very different, there's plenty that we could discuss here, I believe. But I think that uh, we are getting to the end of this and there has been a very lively conversation going on. Uh, in the chat and dear participants, please don't think that you were ignored because I had a really hard time keeping up with it, but I did. Uh, and I would like to invite back uh, Julia. Maybe she would like to, to ask uh, one or two last questions that are coming from the audience if you still have a couple of minutes. Sure, thank you. I hope you can hear me. And we will do it in a super quick and efficient way. One question, one answer. No uh, voice to all the panelists, because <laughs> this way we will not leave this um, discussion. Uh, and also to continue what you said, Ishwan, with all the interesting question you, questions you haven't had a chance to announce, uh, let's maybe plan for a part two uh, of this discussion and maybe invite other people as well. And of course, we will be super happy to welcome back all our amazing panelists. So the question now, which was answer, asked, sorry, asked twice, was this. Uh, is there any TMS that has tried to be modular from the beginning? Clients are different in this industry, as we discussed, right? So why not create a TMS that allows them to the features they want to use, and more importantly, pay for only those? Right, And so uh, in another way, it was asked in the beginning of the conversation by another person, uh, so let me quote, is there a consideration to allow specific clients to have specific features rather than always trying to push new features to every customer um, or maybe make a connector specific to a specific tenant? So um, one answer only, who wants to answer this one? <laughs> Um, it's a double sword edge, uh, so uh, it, it sort of makes sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. And in fact, actually, to some degree, you can claim that uh, many of us, we offer like a different tiers, right? Just if you take different editions. So if you take the smallest edition, it has the smallest amount of features. Typically, it has a focus on some use case, maybe a freelancer use case. Then you have a, uh, like we, have, we call it a team start edition. The use case is like a small teams, right? That don't need like some big enterprise stuff. And then and, the, and you grow. So that's one way that you can kind of scale that. But I do understand, of course, the question that it's more about add-ons, like adding your features. Even that you can find it in various products. Uh, like for example, in our case, we would offer different connectors, different integrations. Uh, no needs to pay for all of them because they're pretty expensive, right? So as you, you pay as you need, basically. Or connection to a BI tools that's uh, that that you know that you can go through our kind of a snowflake account. So there's there's already that, but you need to be careful with not overdoing it. 
because if you do that, uh, you will you will make it more complex for the clients to pick the right combination because the features, they need to work together. They're not standalone, right? So they need to work together. They need to be tested together. They need to kind of make sense. So we certainly, like this is again, kind of a product, product management question. Like you don't want to fragment your product too much because it becomes nightmare to maintain it, to document it, to test it, right? So there's some bundles that make sense and some add-ons maybe for the, for the uh, uh, things that are not as used, but uh, but but not something that where you would literally have like a sheet with the 50 check boxes where you can select uh, like every single feature. That would be just way too complicated. With that, I would like to thank everyone for uh, joining, for attending, and uh, thanks to the participants who were actively like involved in the conversation. Amazing. There will be a recording, of course. And uh, actually, we only had just one question left, so I'm sure we can do something about that after this is uh, finished. Thank you, Juan. Igor, you have a good day. Everyone else from the panelists, have a nice evening and see you around for other webinars and panel discussions and part two of this one, hopefully, um, of our NIMTA language technology series. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thanks much. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.